SpaceX's Super Heavy Prototype Booster 9 is one step closer to its orbital flight test. The booster completed its third cryogenic proof test on Sunday, July 23, on the orbital launch mount. While the previous two cryo-proof tests saw the propellant tanks of the booster filled partially with cryogenic fluids, during the recent test, SpaceX completely filled the booster's liquid oxygen and liquid methane tanks in about 100 minutes. The booster was held in that fully loaded state for the next two hours, during which time venting from the vehicle was observed. The methane tank was completely drained first during the detanking operation, followed by the oxygen tank. It took SpaceX nearly five hours to completely empty the booster. Apart from ensuring the reliability of the plumbing, these types of cryo-proof tests provide engineers with the data they need to determine whether a rocket can endure internal stresses and whether the structure has any leaks. The next major milestone for Booster 9 will be the spin prime test, during which a small quantity of propellant flows through the turbopumps of the booster's Raptor engines to validate plumbing and engine spin-up. The spin prime test will be followed by the static fire test campaign, which is one of the final testing phases before approving the booster for launch. Initial static fire tests will likely involve only a few booster engines, and the test campaign will end with a full 33-engine static fire. Booster 9's partner, Starship 25, which successfully completed a six-engine static fire test in June, is currently sitting on suborbital launch pad B. Once Booster 9 completes all its pre-launch tests, the next milestone will be a Starship full stack, followed by a wet dress rehearsal. The wet dress rehearsal includes many of the procedures SpaceX engineers will perform on launch day, such as pumping propellants into the vehicle's super heavy first stage and Starship upper stage, and a launch day countdown rehearsal that stops a few seconds before the engine fires. The wet dress rehearsal is the final milestone for the Starship before attempting an orbital launch. It should be noted that SpaceX has not yet received a launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration for the second orbital test flight. FAA officials are still investigating the events of the inaugural launch, including the failure of the automated flight termination system to immediately destroy the rocket when it tumbled out of control. A license will only be granted after the investigation is completed, and SpaceX makes the necessary adjustments as per the investigation report. The orbital launch mount and launch pad repair and upgrade works are in their final phases. SpaceX is currently testing the water-cooled steel plates, designed to dump large quantities of water onto the launch mount to deflect the energy of the 33 engines of Super Heavy during liftoff. The first-ever steel plate water discharge test was conducted on July 17, shooting thousands of gallons of water from the steel plates with tremendous force. However, the test carried out was a trial run, and it did not showcase the full potential of the deluge system. A full-pressure water discharge test was conducted on Friday, July 28. The steel plates were designed in such a way that the water was directed away from the super heavy engines to prevent it from entering directly into the engine bells. The installation and testing of the water-cooled steel plates confirm that the deluge system is ready to be activated during the upcoming Booster 9 static fire test. The deluge system plumbing and high-pressure gas canisters are currently receiving some final upgrades. Several pipes and manifolds have been delivered to the launch site lately, and SpaceX plans to install more nitrogen gas canisters behind the water tanks to further increase the force with which the water is pumped. Apart from the steel plates, several other systems of the launch mount were also put to the test during the past few weeks. The 20 small quick disconnect systems that supply the outer 20 Raptor engines of the booster with the propellants they need to begin the ignition process, and the fire extinguisher and detonation suppression system, were a few among them. SpaceX is currently working on pouring high-strength Fondag concrete on the region outside the launch mount to ensure the pad is far more robust than it was before. This aerial image from RGV aerial photography captured on July 20 shows rebars installed around the launch mount and over the steel plate water delivery pipes in preparation for concrete pouring. The launch pad will be ready for static fire testing in the very near future. The redesigned Starship Quick Disconnect mechanism, installed on the launch tower a few weeks ago, was tested last Monday. SpaceX announced in June that it plans to include hot staging on the Starship, starting with its next orbital flight. The technique involves igniting the engines on the Starship's upper stage just before stage separation, while still attached to its booster stage. This will potentially increase the Starship's payload to orbit by 10%, as thrusting will not be paused during flight. SpaceX plans to add an interstage section on top of Super Heavy to allow the exhaust from the upper stage to escape during hot staging.
Because of this extra ring section between the booster and the ship, the Starship Quick Disconnect had to be redesigned to increase its reach by nearly 2 meters. The Quick Disconnect was sent to the build site on June 21 for reconfiguration, and it was reinstalled on the launch tower in the first week of July. The Quick Disconnect mechanism was tested for the first time on July 24, following its reinstallation. Two potential configurations of the Starship Interstage mechanism have been spotted at the Starbase build site lately. Both the rings feature customized truss work with openings for the Starship's exhaust to escape during hot staging. The ring discovered in June had less material and more openings than the one found in May. However, it has more space that could be used to incorporate stringers with the forward section of the booster. Please be aware that SpaceX has yet to officially confirm the interstage design, so that the final design may vary from these two ring sections. A reinforced booster forward tank section, likely to be used for structural verification testing of the hot staging ring section, was spotted at Starbase last Tuesday. Known as Booster 12, this booster forward dome section is entirely covered in stringers on its exterior. The interstage test article will likely be installed on top of Booster 12 for structural testing on the can crusher. A can crusher test rig is basically a test stand designed to simulate the force of a Starship launch on stainless steel test articles to make sure the components can withstand the stresses of the actual flight. Starship 27 parked at the Rocket Garden was cut in half on July 20. At that time, it was unclear why SpaceX chose to dismantle Ship 27. A recent photo shared by RGV Aerial Photography reveals that the common dome of the ship has apparently collapsed. The implosion may have been caused by a drop in pressure inside the ship's methane tank. It is unclear whether this was a result of a design flaw or a human error, and this damage may have led to SpaceX's decision to discard Ship 27. Ship 27, which was moved to the Rocket Garden right after assembly, was never put to any test. Six days after the Ship 27 incident, SpaceX scrapped Starship serial number 15 by cutting the prototype below its methane tank section. The ship, launched in May 2021 on a suborbital test flight, reached an altitude of 10 kilometers before successfully landing on the landing pad. It was the first Starship prototype to successfully fly, land, and be recovered. And now, more than two years later, SpaceX decided to discard the prototype for reasons currently unknown. Super Heavy Booster 10, which successfully completed a cryo-proof test at SpaceX Massey's test facility on July 18, was moved back to the production site last week. The booster is currently stationed at the Rocket Garden. New Mega Bay construction is in progress at the build site. Teams have begun assembling the fifth level of the Mega Bay. The building will have a total of seven levels when completed. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. SpaceX's powerful Falcon Heavy rocket is ready for liftoff for the seventh time from NASA's Kennedy Space Center to send the Jupiter 3 communications satellite into orbit. The rocket was scheduled to launch on July 26 at 3.04 a.m. UTC. But for unknown reasons, the launch team aborted the mission with 65 seconds remaining on the countdown clock. The next opportunity is on Friday, July 28, and the launch might have happened by the time you watch this video. Although the core stage of the rocket will be expended, the mission will see the two Falcon Heavy side boosters return to SpaceX's landing zones 1 and 2. Falcon Heavy's upper stage will deploy the Jupiter 3 into a geostationary transfer orbit, from where it will travel into a geostationary orbit about 35,000 kilometers above the equator. Jupiter 3, owned and operated by Hughes Network Systems, aims to deliver space-based internet service to customers, just like SpaceX's Starlink satellites. The satellite weighs 10.1 tons making it the heaviest geostationary satellite and the heaviest commercial satellite ever launched. Jupiter-3 will have a throughput of 500 gigabits per second, doubling that of the two Jupiter Internet satellites already in orbit. The satellite internet service, named HughesNet, provides connectivity to airplanes, ships, rural communities, and underdeveloped areas worldwide. With its high capacity, Jupiter-3 will enable rural customers to experience download speeds of up to 100 megabits per second, comparable to the average download speeds from the SpaceX Starlink network. However, the two services differ greatly in latency, with Usenet having an average latency of about 600 milliseconds because of its high Earth orbit and Starlink having a latency of 60 milliseconds. This will impact high-paced internet activities like gaming, but will have a lesser effect on more mundane activities. Two large seven-panel solar arrays power Jupiter-3, and when they are fully deployed, the satellite will have a wingspan similar to that of a commercial jet. To support the massive satellite, Jupiter-3 is loaded with nearly 3,500 kilograms of propellant that will be used for both orbit raising as well as station keeping throughout its roughly 20-year service life. 
According to Hughes Network Systems, Jupiter 3 will be in commercial service by the end of the year. On June 26, NASA and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency DARPA, announced a collaboration to demonstrate a nuclear thermal rocket engine in space. Nuclear thermal propulsion technology works by transferring heat from a nuclear fission reactor to a liquid propellant, most likely liquid hydrogen. The liquid propellant will convert into a gas and expand through a nozzle to provide thrust to propel the spacecraft. The system offers a high thrust-to-weight ratio and twice the propellant efficiency of chemical rockets, enabling faster and more robust deep space missions. It will also allow increased science payload capacity and higher power for instrumentation and communication. NASA will invest about $300 million in the program, named Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislinar Operations, or DRACO. While the Draco spacecraft specifications are still being worked out, it will primarily consist of a nuclear thermal propulsion engine system and a big tank to hold the liquid hydrogen propellant. The spacecraft is expected to operate in orbit for a few months and will not carry any payloads or scientific instruments. The mission will focus on the vehicle's nuclear engine, demonstrating that it can work for extended periods in space. The spacecraft will head to a relatively high orbit around Earth, likely somewhere between 700 to 2,000 kilometers. From such altitudes, it will take at least 300 years for the spacecraft to fall back to Earth via atmospheric drag, long enough to ensure that all of its nuclear fuel is spent when it comes down. Under NASA's agreement with DARPA, Lockheed Martin is responsible for spacecraft design, integration, and testing. Virginia-based BWX Technologies is responsible for the design and build of the nuclear fission reactor that will power the engine. And NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate is responsible for the overall management and execution of the nuclear powered Draco engine. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.